Scotland What first springs to mind when I say the word? Whiskey Bagpipes Romantic scenery, maybe Freedom Well, what about imperialism, colonialism, and slavery? Oh, yeah. We tend to forget about imperialism in Scotland, but that was more England, right? Right? There's been a fair amount of criticism concerning how Britain deals with its legacy of imperialism and colonialism. But what's less commonly discussed are the particular and curious ways in which Scotland fails to grapple with its imperial legacy. While there have been attempts to try and bring Scotland's role in imperialism to light, I find that people will still do a few different things. They'll minimise Scotland's role in empire, like, that was the British or English, that, that wasn't the Scottish. And tied to this, I've seen people claim that Scotland's less responsible for empire or colonialism because we ourselves were victims of English colonialism. This video deals with these perspectives and shows how Scotland was deeply involved in empire, how we materially benefited from it, how we distanced ourselves from it, and the modern day political impact of this. And how Ben Shapiro is all involved in, in all of this. These are facts, and facts don't care about your feelings. Don't worry, I'm not going to wear this stupid hat the whole way through the, the video. I don't want to look like an idiot on the internet. Part 1. A Scottish Empire There's a notion among some Scottish people that we were really involved with the British Empire. That was the English, that wasn't really us. And this isn't like that surprising because this was a, a particular strategy used by Victorian Scots to distance themselves from some of the worst aspects of British imperialism like the slave trade. They point to facts like the relatively low number of slave ships that would come into Glasgow compared with English ports like Liverpool as evidence to support the idea that Scotland wasn't involved with uh, at least the slave trade, if not empire as a whole. And this attitude, which has pervaded across time, has morphed into new expressions. For example, in 2009, the Scottish National Party produced a pamphlet which was supposed to encourage uh, people of, of Scottish heritage across the world to come home. The problem was that they only marketed it to New Zealand, Australia and Canada, rather than all former British colonies, which is uh, quite interesting. The promotional photos were all of white people, until in the face of criticism, one Asian face was airbrushed in. So what is Scotland's imperial history? Well firstly, while there's some contention over how pivotal the role of Scotland's failed colonial project was in pushing the Scottish ruling class to establish the uh, union between Scotland and England in 1707, what's more certain is that the union gave the green light for Scotland to become deeply involved in empire. The Act of Union, which was the piece of legislation which brought the two countries together, itself compensated uh, investors in Scotland's failed colonial project with £400,000, and the failed colonial experience taught fledgling Scottish imperialists of the importance of access to English colonial markets and of the protection of the English Navy. And with the Act of Union, Scottish people began flooding every part of the now British Empire. While Glasgow wasn't really a slave port, it did monopolise Chesapeake tobacco trade by the end of the 18th century, and it was deeply involved in chattel slavery through its use as a port for sugar and trade across the empire. In fact, Scotland has a deep connection to the slave trade, particularly in the Caribbean, where Scottish people were disproportionately numerous in slave societies. In fact, Scottish people were disproportionately represented throughout every level of empire in intellectual, administrative, military and governmental positions. We have a shared history. Whether they know it or not, whether they like it or not, we do have a shared history with them because at some time, 
In our country's history, Scottish people operated a slave fort in Sierra Leone because all the able-bodied men were shipped off as slaves. And we Scots were involved from top to bottom. Well, from, from 1728 to 1807, when the fort closed down, yes, it was run by Scottish companies. Yep. It wasn't just a case of Scottish plebs being used as cannon fodder by English toffs, but of Scottish influence at literally every level of the imperial project, including at the forefront of the missionary project, which lent imperialism its moral legitimacy as God's work, as J.M. Mackenzie puts it. The Scots' infiltration of the East India Company's marine and medical establishments was notorious. So was their presence at every level of the company's activities, as soldiers, governors, diplomats, and Orientalist scholars. As is now well known, Warren Hastings, a pivotal figure in British imperialism in India, gathered a group of Scots around him. And Scots governors in southern India were later to institute a wholly new land revenue system based upon the peasantry. Scotland and Scottish people played a fundamental role throughout the entirety of the British Empire. On top of this, the material impact of imperialism on Scotland was undoubtedly massive, as streams of goods, trade and wealth stolen from colonies across the world was funneled into Scotland's industrial development and basically created the country that we have today. This process can be generalised across the entirety of the global north, and if you want to learn more about how imperialism presented a massive project of colonial theft, then I can't recommend Jason Hickel's book, The Divide, more highly. More than just developing Scotland's industry though, imperialism was central in generating a Scottish identity which is still evident today. Clear examples of this are things like uh, a tartan, which uh, before empire was just associated with the Highland clans, which as least points out, uh, nine out of 10 Scots saw as the sign of a thief, or presumably also the sign of an immortal being who takes heads. There can be only one. But with the Empire, there was a conscious effort led by figures such as Walter Scott, who you might know from his Gothas monument in Edinburgh, to create a romantic image of the Scottish warrior hero clad in striking tartan, an image which took hold of the Scottish cultural imagination. This is Robert Roy MacGregor. Come to reclaim the 32 beasts stolen from his lordship, James Graham Marquis of Montrose. And there were other aspects of Scottish cultural identity that were also forged within imperialism. For example, at the start of this video I listed romantic scenery as something which is closely associated with Scotland. Creating this link in the cultural imagination between Scotland and beautiful scenery was a central aspect of what were called the Scottish Imperial Exhibitions, which took place in the 19th and 20th centuries, and were like big carnivals to imperialism, with the explicit goal of creating a new Scottish cultural renaissance within the imperial and colonial frame. These exhibitions emphasised the romantic Scottish scenery alongside its heroic myths in an attempt to, like, eh, create tourism and, and, and bring tourism from across empire to Scotland to, to bring people home. And on the political level, Scottish political figures and organisations from across the spectrum, including trade unionist and founder of the Labour Party, Keir Hardy, would often emphasise Scotland's role in empire as a way to legitimate their political demands. Frankly, I find this really fascinating because taken together it seems like British imperialism didn't just create like a single cohesive British identity, rather it enabled the generation of subnational identity in Scotland, which enabled the generation of further national myths like the heroic Scottish warrior hero, which might not have been present otherwise. Whatever national identity exists in Scotland today has much of its foundation in the project of empire. So what changed? Part 2. Cultural Amnesia As empire declined, there were degrees of difference 
and how different parts of the UK dealt with their imperial legacy. In England, this often takes the form of a sort of romantic nostalgia for an era in which Britain civilised the world. In Scotland though, it's often taken a different form, either in distancing ourselves from being involved or more kind of insidiously admitting that we were involved but saying that we're somehow less culpable than the English, either because we were unwilling participants or that we were ourselves a victim of English colonialism. Some people hate the English, I don't. They're just wankers. We on the other hand are colonised by wankers. Can't even find a decent culture to be colonised by. So was Scotland colonised by the English? No. To be more substantive here, after the Act of Union, Scotland was integrated in the political structures of Britain and, as we've seen already, of empire. Scottish people held positions and power throughout the British political system, including at the very top and through the systems of British representative democracy. So there was significant Scottish political influence throughout the state. This isn't a feature of a subjugated, colonised state. Adherence to the notion that Scotland was colonised by England will often point to the sidelining of uh, Scots dialect and Gaelic in favour of standardised English. Bonjour, you cheese-eating surrender monkeys! The problem with this perspective is that it views standard English as a foreign tongue to Scotland as a whole. When, which it wasn't. There were areas in Scotland where it was less common, but this was the same in England, where local dialects and languages were overtaken by standardised English throughout the period of industrialisation. Does this mean that England colonised itself since the 18th century? Well, maybe. But I think then we're breaking down the usefulness of colonialism as an analytic frame to understand the world. As Connell argues, by obscuring a similar history of cultural incorporation within England itself, the suggestion that this process constitutes the English colonisation of Scotland performs a nationalist function by transforming the modernisation of Scotland from an endogenous process of, de of development into an exogenous form of oppression. Another argument I've seen come up here is the shite hand dealt to working class or agrarian Scots throughout the period of empire and industrialisation. I've seen people point to the Highland clearances in which Scottish landowners pushed off small croft farmers from their land uh, in favour of like pastoral farming uh, as, as, as a process of English colonialism when it can be more effectively understood as a process of industrialisation or a pro process of capitalist development. The argument that Scotland was colonised by England I don't know, often leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Because, like, even some of the worst off in Scotland, those dispossessed by the Highland clearances, would often emigrate to the colonies as part of the oppression of empire, whether that was in India or uh, to become involved in chattel slavery in the Caribbean. And as we've seen, Scottish people were present throughout empire and benefited massively from it. So, I don't know, it seems a bit tasteless to try and draw an equivalence between the oppression of the proletariat or working class Scottish and the oppression of empire. Look, I know that's a bit of a moralistic argument, but I don't know, it's just my opinion, man. But that isn't to say that Scottish people aren't oppressed. They were and are oppressed by capitalism. But they weren't colonially oppressed. And importantly, this claim of English colonisation of Scotland shouldn't be used to minimise Scotland's active role within empire and uh, the, the benefits that we still see from it today. By saying, oh, we were colonised too, you know, it seems to me like a way of minimising Scotland's role in and responsibility for colonialism and imperialism. This failure to truly recognise the ways in which empire built Scotland's wealth within Britain and put it in, a, in the position it's in today isn't a form of imperial nostalgia, but can be more accurately described as cultural amnesia. That is, selectively forgetting certain dimensions of Scottish history in order to fit 
a more palatable national narrative. Was America founded on slavery? One of the most uttered myths regarding the United States is that it was founded on slavery. America wasn't founded on slavery. It was founded in spite of slavery, and we fought the bloodiest war in American history to end it. But interestingly, there have been many attempts to try and redress this balance and properly grapple with Scotland's imperial history. And yet, the cultural amnesia persists. And why is this? Well, it's here that we can finally bring in the man with all the facts and many of the logics. Ben Chapino and Sam. I said certified free cows. Seven days a week. Wet ass P word. Make that pull out game weak. Ben Shapiro has a document on his website which he describes as. Well, as I say in an article entitled, here's a list of all the giant bad dumb things I've ever said. But while Benny Boy admits that these were bad things to say, he never addresses the underlying philosophies which drive him to say those things, and nor does he ever address that it's precisely the inflammatory, often racist language that these, these takes used that were so fundamental in building his popularity and wealth in the first place. For example, you said sure. Israelis like to build, Arabs like to bomb crap and live in open sewage. But he can point to this list of bad things that he's said in the past as a way of like showing that he acknowledges his past failings and is trying to do better while never really making any substantive reflection of why he took those positions in the first place or uh, indeed any steps to changing his behaviour. Can you see the parallels here? By acknowledging some responsibility for Scotland's role in empire but distancing it from the worst aspects by doing things like saying we were colonised or we were forced into it. Scotland gets to do this Ben Shapiro deflection and simultaneously feel like we're addressing our dark past with imperialism while failing to fully come to terms with our role in it and the ways in which we did and continue to benefit from it. In a way it's similar to a phenomenon known as a public secret. That is a process through which a fact is generally known but about which there's a kind of culture of silence or knowing what not to know. We know enough to know that Scotland was involved in empire, but also know enough not to know more. What's difficult about a public secret is that it's resistant to being revealed. That, in fact, being revealed is essential to its position as a secret. So when we talk about Scotland's role in imperialism as if it's a secret to be revealed, then we reinforce the idea that it's something that we should in fact be keeping secret. So academic papers revealing Scotland's true past can in a way reinforce the secrecy, which I guess is also true of this video. Ah, fuck. Part three, who cares? So Scotland was deeply involved in empire and in many ways our national identity was forged and has its foundations in Imperial Scotland. But who cares? Why does it matter that we fully grapple with and fully acknowledge our history and the ways in which we were forged and benefit from imperialism? Firstly, in general, I think it's essential that all global North countries fully acknowledge and come to terms with the fact that imperialism was a massive process of stealing wealth and resources from the global south and that, uh, and that they use that to industrialise the global north and that this has profound implications for how we should seek to uh, approach issues like global south debt or climate change. Again these issues are more fully fleshed out in Jason Hickel's The Divide and they deserve a whole video unto themselves. So here I want to really look at the connection between uh, imperial cultural amnesia in Scotland and our political situation. There's a tendency in Scotland for us to view ourselves as more progressive or more left-wing than in England and I think cultural amnesia and the way that we approach imperialism is part of that. The distancing of responsibility and the notion that Scotland was a victim of imperialism itself seems to create an idea that maybe we in Scotland are just, I don't know, maybe we're just more progressive. Maybe we're just naturally more progressive people than the English. 
You can see this in the writing of people like Michael Fry, who wrote in his book The Scottish Empire that unlike the, unlike the English, the Scottish were traders, not raiders. And this attitude bleeds over into other areas of academic thought, with scholars like Graham MacDonald asserting in 2006 that there's a prevalence of broadly leftist politics demonstrated by a majority of Scots for the last 30 years or so. It's an idea that up here, we're just somehow more progressive than down there. But the problem is it's uh, simply not true. Scottish social attitudes are virtually indistinguishable from English ones, even in areas such as immigration. But what's worrying is that both Scottish and English social attitudes are moving rightwards. A lot of people will point to the unpopularity of the Conservative Party as evidence that Scotland is you no know, more progressive than England. But whether people vote or don't vote for particular parties isn't a particularly reliable indicator of whether like whether a country is a progressive or left-wing heartland. And this is particularly true because the main party in Scotland, the SNP, are definitely not a left-wing party. They are firmly a neoliberal one. I think the view that Scotland is just naturally more progressive than England, of which I think cultural amnesia regarding imperialism as part, is something that the left in Scotland needs to be very keenly aware of and not complacent about. I'm not, I'm not taking a position in this video about whether or not Scotland should have independence because uh, this isn't a video on Scottish independence and I, I don't have the strength to wear their Scottish independence discourse right now. But I think there's a complacency on the left that uh, should Scotland become independent, then we would immediately be able to do all these great leftist policies and we could transform Scotland into a progressive heartland. But with a firmly neoliberal party like the SNP being totally dominant in Scottish politics and with Scottish social attitudes being so similar to English ones, I don't think that's a conclusion that we can take for granted at all. The Scottish left will need to be prepared to fight just as hard in an independent Scotland as they would as part of the UK, which involves advocating the rectifying of imperial crimes and the destruction of power systems which maintain the exploitation of the global south by the global north. Well, thanks for watching. Uh, I'm quite pleased with this video, I think. Well, we'll see once I've edited it. Um, and if you are too, then please feel free to like and subscribe and leave a comment and, you know, hit the wee bell thing, um, which I, I hear helps. Um, thanks to the Lit Crit guy, uh, Tom Nicholas and Simon Witten for lending their voices for quotes in this video. They all have great channels, which you should definitely go check out and subscribe and do all that stuff with. Throughout the filming of this video, I've had a few whiskeys, so, you know, I'll do my best. Um, let me just... Also, massive thank you to uh, all my patrons who are helping me make this video and uh, get through my PhD, and particularly to Paul Singleton, Tamash Kispeter, Seamus Morrison, uh, Stephanie Beverly, Aaron, Sinan Kos, and Jay Fraser Cartwright. If you'd like to support me too, you can go to patreon.com slash johnthedunkin, or uh, give a one-off donation using Kofi. Both links are in the description. Oh. Ah. I mean, this isn't the best whiskey around, but it's orders of magnitude better than what I was drinking in the last video. Cheers. <laughs>